In this lesson, we're going to take a look at the final two enrichment methods uh, that are of concern to us within the context of this course. Now, these were the, as far as I can tell, the last two enrichment methods that were ever developed for uranium. Now, they both use lasers uh, to selectively ionize uranium-235 and not uranium-238. One of them operates uh, on an atomic level, that is on individual atoms of uranium. The other operates on molecules of UF6. So let's take a look at the first one. The first one is AVLIS, which stands for Atomic Vaporization Laser Isotope Separation. Now, both of these methods rely on the difference between how the electronic structure uh, of the atoms or the molecules that contain the atoms. And these are quantum mechanical corrections between energy levels uh, and the electrons that are attached to the atoms or molecules. Now, to do this, you, it's, it's actually not quite as simple as it sounds uh, because you need a laser first to impart enough energy just to pick off like a single electron to, from uranium-235 and not to uranium-238. What this means, because the difference between their ionization states is so small, 10 to the minus 5 EV, is that you need the ability to tune your laser to one part in 100,000 accuracy to get that preferential ionization. And, you know, this, I don't know how much that number would mean to you, uh, but it is an incredibly precise difference and is kind of the make or break for this type of enrichment method. Now, AVLIS, because it operates on atoms of uranium, has as its feed not UF6, but metallic uranium. So we, when we go from yellow cake, instead of converting it to UF6, it would have to be further processed to extract only uh, the uranium in, uh, that was contained within it so that you have a metallic product. This product is then fed into the system heated up, vaporized, and then have irradiated with a laser to produce that ionization preferentially to uranium-235. So there are a bunch of working components to the system, but the real important one is, again, that laser, which has to be extremely precise in its energy output so that we can uh, get that preferential separation. Now, they use solid-state lasers for these. Uh, they're called dye-feed lasers. You can look them up, or feed-dye lasers. And they're kind of, the wavelength that we need isn't usually what we start at, so they have to start with one type of laser and then convert it down into that proper energy. And it's kind of infrared. It's orange-red orange, orange wavelength, so it's on the lower end of the energy spectrum. And... These lasers, these colors, again, correspond very particularly to the energy level that we need. Now, you probably ask, well, did this ever work? Well, yes, in fact, it did. Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories built a pilot plant with this technology that ran for about a year and a half. And it was done as a proof of concept saying, you know, not only does this work, but this works on a scale that could be increased to something like a commercial capacity. They processed natural uranium. Uh, they also took some of the depleted uranium that came out of other enrichment methods and were able to further extract the very small percentage of uranium-235 that existed in that waste product, which is really good because it means that we're not just throwing away the useful uranium-235. Now, when they closed the pilot plant, they licensed the technology for AVLIS uh, to the United States Enrichment Corporation. However, USEC never did anything with this technology. Uh, the reason, the main reason being is that USEC originally operated the gaseous diffusion plants uh, here in the United States and then decided to get into centrifuge technology and built themselves a centrifuge pilot plant. But at that particular time that all this was going on, the global supply of already processed and enriched uranium uh, basically became so you know, large that there was no economic incentive for anybody to use uh, or to build a plant using this method uh, to enrich uranium anymore. 
Uh, it was it, and this exists to this day. A global glut of processed uranium, especially at the fuel grades, so that none of these uh, none of these new technologies are economically viable. Uh, which is kind of sad because it's a really impressive method for doing this. And if you remember back to a few lectures ago, we talked about um, separation potential and then enrichment potential or separation factor and enrichment factor. Well, AVLIS, EMIS, uh, and EMLIS, which we'll talk about here in a second, they're so good at this, the separation that we have to use uh, that enrichment factor uh, instead of our separation factor. So what we see here, uh, basically these are, uh, this is actually from Livermore, uh, as it was the uh, picture on the previous slide, which showed the experimental setup. Um, I suspect that these are drums of some uranium product. I probably depleted uranium product, uh, which is then processed. And kind of what you get out of this are these little pucks uh, of solid metal uranium. Now, they, we're going to see that th there's a problem with doing it this way. Uh, and then we have a little simple schematic that shows uh, <laughs> kind of like a little, uh, you know, crucible, uh, basically something that you heat your uranium metal up in order to vaporize it. Uh, it starts rising within this, uh, within this chamber. The laser ends up hitting this vapor and uh, preferentially ionizes the U-235. Now that it's ionized, it can be attracted to something like a negatively charged plate because it's positive. Uh, so you, what, for the most part, what you're going to get is a very high uh, enriched product out of even just a single stage. Now, is it 100% perfect? No, because again, they're just like with all of these other methods that we've talked about, there are variations and, and fluctuations in like the laser, um, the laser output with the vaporization, the ionization states that we're looking for. But for the most part, just like with uh, EMIS, you could technically get 99.99 something uh, percent pure uranium-235 out of this method. Now, let's talk about the issues. Well, the big one is criticality. Because you're using a metallic dense uh, output product, what you can find very rapidly is that you're assembling what will become or could become a critical mass very rapidly. So you must at all times using this method be aware to portion out or to separate out the mass that of very pure uranium-235 so that you do not end up with that critical mass, which could then have a chain reaction initiated by something like, uh, you know, a neutron, uh, a spontaneously fissioned neutron from uranium-238 or even uh, cosmic neutrons coming down through the atmosphere. You know, it doesn't take much. Once you set off that chain reaction, now you have a, you're not going to have a weapon, uh, obviously, but the amount of radiation that's going to be released in that very short amount of time uh, would be extremely detrimental to anybody around it. The other main issue is that this output is basically the same material that you would use in a weapon core. So it would make it very attractive for would-be proliferators to not build something like this themselves, but to figure out who was doing it and to steal that highly enriched metallic product directly uh, from somebody else, which could then be quite easily fashioned into the core of a uranium type weapon. The laser has uh, some issues. It's not like you can go down to uh, go on to eBay or Amazon or, or down to an electronic shop and get a laser that is capable of what needs to be done here. Uh, they have an extremely high repetition rate uh, in order to not burn out the laser, but still provides uh, a sufficient amount of ionization. So the proliferation concerns, there are a couple. Uh, one is that it uses technology that's almost readily available in most uh, advanced uh, nations, most technologically advanced nations. Uh, so basically, everybody has this stuff. Well, most everybody. There are some countries that are not at, quite at this level yet, but for the most part, um, this is easily achievable by just about everybody. 
Now, the specifics and the engineering part of it is something else entirely, but just the, the base amount of equipment, like with EMIS, this is not difficult to get a hold of. Unfortunately, when we're looking, when we're, we'll look at uranium signatures here in a little bit, the physical size of, of the plant that you would need for enrichment uh, on a reasonable scale, the, the thermal output of such a plant, and the power usage of such a plant are very minimal compared to every other enrichment method. Well, almost every other enrichment method. So it doesn't take a lot of power, it doesn't have a big footprint, and it doesn't put out a lot of heat. So in terms of being able to determine whether or not a would-be proliferator was using this method, there are very few things that you could use to go on. Even the equipment, it's all dual use. So there'd be no you know, triggers that could be set with a very particular piece of technology that was specific to uranium enrichment. So uh, having somebody use this as a proliferator, it, it really does cause quite a few problems. And it's also a proven technique. Um, a lot of information about this is available in open media. So this would, I mean, if you were talking about a state level proliferator, this would be very attractive if they had the uh, the knowledge, the background, and the infrastructure to pull this off. So the other laser enrichment method, which I mentioned before, is EMLIS, which is molecular laser isotope separation, which also goes by the name, commercial name of Silex, as it was independently developed uh, in Australia by a company, and they license it, this technology, under the Silex brand. Now, Silex is a lot different than... Uh, Avlis because it actually operates on the UF6 molecules, providing, again, very specific ionization uh, in order to separate out the 235 bearing molecules from the 238 bearing molecules. So let's step through this slide just one bit at a time. So first we have a diagram that shows one laser, a pulse carbon dioxide laser, uh, which has a certain wavelength, which goes into a something called a Raman converter to come out at a different wavelength. That is then uh, hit, uh, you, you basically run this laser through your gas of UF6, but then you need a second, much shorter wavelength or higher energy laser, uh, a UV type laser. So, uh, you know, one's down here at the bottom of the, uh, of the visible elect uh, electromagnetic spectrum. The UV would be more towards the top of the visible spectrum. Uh, and the combination of both lasers interacting uh, with the UF6 is what produces that preferential ionization. Okay, so what happens with the first one? Well, once we get the proper wavelength, um, and I put this little thing down here uh, to show what, what is parahydrogen. Well, hydrogen exists as a gas, uh, molecular hydrogen, which is H2. Now, there's two different ways that you could think of how these gases um, are put together. One is with a quantum spin state for both atoms pointing in the same direction, and the other is with them pointing in opposite directions. So orthohydrogen is where they're both pointing in the same direction, and parahydrogen is where they're pointing in opposite directions. Now, in order for this to be useful as a converter, you basically have to you know, refrigerate it down to the point where it's a solid or a liquid you know, something dense, and then the photons are going to come, they're going to interact very specifically to change that wavelength by a very precise amount from uh, 10.8 microns uh, to a lower energy or longer wavelength, 16 microns. Now, as I mentioned before with Avlis, there's always some uncertainty going on here, uh, especially with the laser output, you know, getting something so finely tuned, you know, to a factor of uh, one out of a hundred thousand, there's going to be slight variations there. So instead of just using this laser to excite the 235 molecules, it's also exciting to some extent the 238 molecules. Now that's not as much of an issue as it sounds, and we'll see why here in a second with the, with the UV laser. So once we take and we irradiate with our first laser, our UF6 gas, then what we're going to do is we're going to take a second laser 
with, again, a very specific energy or wavelength, and then we're going to hit that same gas with that laser. Now, what that's going to do is it's going to provide just enough energy to ionize the, U, the UF6 molecule that contains uranium-235 and not the molecule that contains uranium-238. So this is where this, this second step is where we're actually going to see that preferential ionization. Now, once this happens and it's given just enough energy, the uranium-235 molecule will basically kick off a fluorine atom and it will become, instead of UF6, it will become UF5. Now, UF5 has different physical properties than UF6. So once it becomes UF5, it doesn't want to be a gas anymore, and it will basically fall out of your stream, your gas stream, as a solid, as, a, as almost a powder, if you will. Uh, so instead of with AVLIS and with EMIS, where you know we're going to get some solid product of, of either 235 or 238, this is going to give us a compound of UF5, which itself will just naturally separate itself from the UF6 stream. So in one respect, in that particular respect, it's actually a little bit easier uh, than, than operating at the atomic level and having that metallic product. Now this second laser, because it is such a different energy than the first laser, apparently they cannot be handled by the same optics. So you need to have a much more complex setup than you would with something like Avlis in order to achieve these results. So you would have your first laser, it would have its own set of optics. Then you would have to have your second laser with its own set of optics uh, in order to perform the same task you could do with one set in Avlis. So here's an example of how Emlis actually, or Silix actually works. So we have both of our uh, uranium hexafluoride molecules, one containing 235, one containing 238. We hit them with the first laser. And again, we're going to probably excite both of them, uh, again, due to uncertainties. But this is not that big of a deal. It doesn't really matter if we're exciting some uranium-238 as well. So now we have our molecules that are in an excited state, which means they have some basically internal energy to the molecule that makes it a little unstable. Now we're going to hit it with that second laser, that uh, ultraviolet laser, which is going to impart just enough additional energy to the 235 molecule to vibrate hard enough, basically, to uh, achieve that ionization or that ripping off of the fluorine atom, while it's not quite enough to happen with the uranium-238 even if it was form or previously excited uh, by the lower energy laser. Once that happens, the UF6 turns into UF5, which has different, again, material properties. It turns into a solid and literally just falls out of the gas. And the UF6 that contains the U238, nothing happens. It continues on its way. So in this particular case, we don't have a metallic product. We have UF5 it needs to undergo additional processing to be useful, uh, especially in terms of uh, you know, constructing a weapon, but you won't run into the criticality issues that you would uh, with Avlis. So in that particular respect, it may be more attractive to proliferators. Uh, secondly, the, you know, this whole process is actually, although they have been, you know, this method has been classified by any of the governments that are involved, Australian, United States. It is a commercial company that holds this information. So that in and of itself may be, again, more uh, attractive for a proliferator to try to get um, the engineering schematics to build this particular type uh, of enrichment. Now, one of the thing is it uses UF6. UF6 is being the most common um, precursor to uh, all of the other, almost all of the other enrichment methods. So it's very widely available uh, and even available in differing uh, enrichment levels, depending on, you know, who you get it from, uh, whether you get it from a, 
a commercial entity or even a government entity, you could, you know, your UF6 is just, there's so much of it around that getting your hands on some of it is not all that difficult. So that's the last of the enrichment methods. Uh, the laser methods, again, they are very attractive or could be very attractive to a would-be proliferator uh, because the technology barrier to entry is kind of low. But each of them has one or two things very specific uh, that would have to be either researched independently uh, or would have to have the specifications um, you know, acquired through espionage of some kind. So let's now take a look at a couple of the practical application considerations uh, for both MLIS and Silex. So first of all, you kind of need some pretty low temperatures uh, for certain things, especially again for that para-hydrogen Raman converter. It needs to be really cold in order to be in a solid form that's useful for that uh, laser energy conversion. Now, kind of like the aerodynamic methods, both the helicon and the Becker nozzle, um, this isn't pure UF6 that's going through. There is a carrier gas involved. And the reason for that is it just has to do with what the properties of UF6 are when we're hitting it with the lasers and to get that UF5 coming out. So it's not just pure UF6. There is uh, some dilution uh, with a carrier gas, which is not specified. And finally, the rapid separation to get that UF5 to drop out of the uh, of the gas stream, so it's not carried, you know, outside, you know, out of the uh, of the enrichment, um, you know, unit, if you will. Uh, you have to uh, you have to put that additional gas in there so that that free that fluorine that we've kicked off of the UF6 molecule doesn't just go and recombine and end up with getting us absolutely nowhere. So we have our carrier gas, which we need so that this doesn't happen. So we're, that, again, it's not specified, but with a little bit of chemistry knowledge, you could probably figure it out, figure out what it is. Um, me, I, I don't do chemistry and uh, I've never been interested in looking it up. So here's a neat little uh, uh, diagram of how something like Emlis or Solis, Silex would work. So we have our UF6 and our carrier gas coming in one end. Uh, we have our uh, expansion reason, region. Uh, this is where just the gas uh, changes density a little bit. Uh, we have our first infrared lasers to get that initial ion or that initial excitation of our UF6 molecule. Then we have our UV lasers so that that 235 UF6 molecule is going to kick off a of fluorine. Uh, that's going to happen right here in the temperature and pressure recovery, UF6 particle growth. And then right towards the end of that is where our UF5, or sorry, this is UF5 particle growth. Right at the end of that is where we're going to collect that, uh, that particulate matter, that UF5, and our UF6 and the rest of the carrier gas uh, and that fluorine that we stripped out, that all exits the system. So again, this is not really beyond the capabilities of most modern states uh, to acquire most of what's needed to do this. There are some specifics, uh, but um, it is of concern that uh, this has the same detectability issues that Avalis does, which is uh, it doesn't have a big physical footprint, uh, thermal output, power requirements, and additionally, it doesn't even use metallic uranium. It uses a readily available um, feedstock of UF6. So that pretty much concludes all of the uranium methods, enrichment methods that we're going to talk about in this course. Uh, so moving on, we're going to look at some signatures of uranium enrichment. Uh, and then we're going to look at the other path uh, to special nuclear materials for a weapon, uh, which is the plutonium path. So we'll look at how do we make plutonium uh, and then once we've made plutonium, how do we separate it from the stuff we made it from uh, and uh, several other related topics.